And may uh, do you have, I don't think you do uh, yet. We're still figuring out a couple of quirks as, as we make this go industrial. But Sergio, do you have controls for mute and uh, record and such on your side? Nope. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will quit recording when I have to leave, but that'll have us through the, uh, certainly through Sergio's presentation, but we'll, some of the Q&A will be cut out. Uh, and then it will just be live and empty after you're all off. <coughs> So anyway, welcome everybody. We know who our great speaker is and there, I know already that um, he's gonna have some really interesting and even fun stuff to share. Uh, I've learned a ton already from him. Uh, and so it is without further ado, uh, with uh, on the general topic of millennial and millennials and spirituality. Uh, so here is our millennial uh, Latinx, here's Waldo. <laughs> or as we would say, donde esta Waldo? Yeah. <laughs> so Good morning, morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning. Greetings, greetings. All right. So my topic today will be on millennials and millennial spirituality. Uh, I will take us through this fairly brief, I call it three-part conversation, presentation, through what is generally known as, I think, very important things to keep in mind when we as a church uh, continue to ask ourselves, what do, who are we in this new age and for this new generation, right? And who are the new generation in the church? So I'll be taking us through part one, which is a really kind of a boring part, which is the demographic part, Part two, talking about misconceptions, and then part three, talking a general overview about spirituality and church for millennials. Uh, and then we'll pick up next week and go into a little more depth into that. So without further ado, I will put on my, uh, I will share my screen here and we will have, we will get at it. Can you all see this? Yes. Yes. All right. I like the flowers, so I, I chose that. I'm a really flowery kind of person. <laughs> Here's the dealio. Part one, part two, and part three, what I just told you all. Demographics, relationships, spirituality, political engagement, race and sexuality. For millennials, and we'll, we'll discuss this, demographics, right? This material here isn't just so that we can like, you know, what's a millennial? I don't know who these people are. They just eat avocado toast. Um, <laughs> This is, right, so that we can get into really the, just the wider kind of world that millennials inhabit. Um, I included this quote from one of my favorite bands. It's, it's uh, they're called the 21 Pilots. My name is Blurry Face and I care what you think. It's a, the, the, the let's say the song isn't necessarily appropriate uh, to play, but it's a really good song. All right. So, Basic, what are millennials? When were they born? How old are they? So as you can tell here, I took this from the Pew Research Center. Um, we have really just a listing of generations according to, we would say the, the most, the latest, right? The ones that have, they're that still alive with us, but they're kind of the oldest, to the most recent kind of iteration of people uh, that we call the Generation Z. Millennials were born between 81 and 96. So that, that's our general bracket. Like there's a common misconception that like, you know, millennials are either, millennials today are still kind of like in their early 20s. They kind of act like they're in their early 20s. Sometimes we are like in our early 20s. Uh, but generally like millennials today are fairly old actually. We're, we're almost hitting middle age. So we're not the old, we're not the young little chickadees that we once thought we were. Um, so the most important thing about this particular generation is it compared, compared to other previous generations, the millennials are considered the most diverse generation in American history before the Generation Z. Generation Z is the most diverse, period. Um, so like a general number, a general figure, like 
55 to 56% of, of millennials identify as just uh, Caucasian, white in the census, and with no other like kind of ethnicity added into that. The next largest demographic group we have are Latinos. They comprise about, about a fourth of, of all millennials. That includes Latinos that are either 100, what we call like white non-Hispanic or like Hispanic with, with a mixture of other different kinds of ethnicities and races. So this kind of image, for me, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I got this at this like hearth and home website. So, you know, the grilling outdoorsy kind of website. And you would never imagine, right? This like outdoorsy kind of website has this photo of a quintess. I wouldn't call it quintessential millennial because I'm not outside grilling or outside in the patio with my laptop. My laptop would get destroyed. Uh, but this is kind of, if you, if you think about how millennials are and who they socialize with, this is kind of like a snippet of really how millennials kind of interact and, and how they really are comprised today. All right, so the next thing that kind of is important is relationships in marriage. So we have one, we have a generation that is extremely diverse, right? And diverse in many ways. Diverse in the ways that they are relating in marriages and in relationships and how they socialize. So the general idea amongst millennials or the general thing, the general trend that's going along with millennials, right? Is that a majority of millennials are actually not necessarily mar getting married at earlier ages, like previous generations, right? Um, right at the corner, corner left there, you see it's a, this is a statistic from the Brookings Institute, uh, marital status, uh, marital status of millennials by race and, race and ethnicity. So what is something that you, seem to notice there in the actual, um, this actual demographic. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds. What do you guys see? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. They're pretty even except for the black uh, community in that never married. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? It also just looks like a very small percentage are actually divorced or separated or widowed. So that seems, I don't know if it's because they haven't necessarily been married very long <laughs> or <laughs> if it's actually the statistic of, you know, sticking, like waiting till later to get married and then just sticking it out. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just, just speak uh, and since like, can't necessarily toggle, just speak up if you want to say something. Well, the percentages of, of divorces among whites, blacks, and Hispanic are, are very similar. But there's the, the Asian population looks much, much more stable because they, they're, more of them are married and fewer of them divorce. I think there's an underlying cultural difference going on still. Anyone else? Does this take into account mixed marriages? Because I think that's more common amongst the millennials than uh, other generations. So it doesn't really uh, tease that out. Very good, very good. No, precisely, I mean, excellent, excellent insight there. So there's, there are a couple of things. One, when we deal with any kind of research and, and at the end of this presentation, I'll make this presentation available. There's just a series of different institutes that have made kind of their, their whole focus is to do these kind of like demographic analyses, right? And so the problem with, with, this, with this little, the Brookings Institution is it doesn't take into account mixed marriages. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell us, you know, why? Why is it that there's just not a lot of divorces? Is it because of longevity? Is it because of, you know, they're just not, they're marrying at a later age. They're just saying that this is the general trend. And even then, 
right? There's not a lot of um, what we call cultural and racial kind of sensitivity. It doesn't really take into account the complexities uh, that, that really define uh, millennials. As a whole, millennials, right? Not only are we not that necessarily homogenous, right? We're, we're very much so a people of, of peoples of different like mixed marriages. So that's something that I think, on the one hand, the tool that's helpful for here is to, is to see like how many folks are simply not married. Right. But on the other hand, it doesn't really give us an accurate depiction of that. Um, and so to add on a little bit, am I hearing my? I'm hearing my Okay, anyway. Okay, anyway. Oh, crap. <laughs> uh, is there uh, some... Is there some... Let me see. All right. Okay, good. Very good. I don't know what happened, but something happened. All right. So that being said, you know, um, one of the things that, that usually gets kind of neglected besides this idea that millennials are they're getting married later or millennials have are in mixed marriages is this idea, right, uh, of how millennials date and how millennials socialize. Um, I chose this small little, on the far bottom left corner, kind of this little screen cap here, 12 ways millennials and baby boomers date differently. Obviously, like this isn't like substantial research uh, but it's just really uh, a way that at least how my generation kind of sees, like tries to compare themselves with other generations. We usually do, I call it the BuzzFeed method, right? So we go online, we look at these 12 ways or 10 ways that uh, millennials socialize or millennials date differently. Um, and in, in one way, like this is as funny as this is, on the other hand, some of the, the ways that uh, this particular website like kind of details the millennial experience is actually quite helpful. Uh, for example, with the, with the advent of social media, there are dating apps, right? So millennials date online and we use apps for that. And there's a variety of apps. Uh, the most infamous one is Tinder uh, amongst, um, amongst straight people. And then there's this, there's a whole hookup culture and they use what's called Grindr. And so you have these kind of the advent of, of these apps kind of changed the way that we socialize and we, mar and we marry, right? So because of this kind of easy access relationships, um, people are in constant contact with each other in ways that they weren't in previous generations. So people are always high speed, kind of, if I want to know where my spouse is, I can just text them and I can immediately know where they're at. Now, as a result of this kind of like technological issue, what ends up happening? So you have things like milestones, traditional milestones that we would say like buying a house, renting together, moving in together. Those aren't significant milestones. Technology has added this kind of uh, way of understanding relationships that are a lot more loose, they're a lot more flexible. So because of that, you know, questions of who are you dating how long have you been going steady, right? These kind of ways that previous generations thought of dating and marriage and engagement, those are all in flux, right? People can date multiple people at the same time. There isn't a set one way in which one becomes quote unquote steady. And even the idea of dating isn't necessarily uh, the most helpful in the way that millennials understand their relationship patterns. Um, so yeah, I mean, as much as this little website is kind of clickbait, I mean, it does actually have, it does reflect at least some of this more anecdotal experiences that some of my colleagues have had and some of my friends have had when it comes to dating and marriage and the like. Okay. Um, so yeah, so now we get to a little bit of the meat and potatoes of today's discussion. Spirituality of millennials. So millennials as a whole, right? Um, as you can tell right there, um, on this left-hand side uh, website, millennials generally, as a whole, think about it, Key Research Center has identified about a third of millennials, right, are what we call spiritually unaffiliated. They don't have a particular religion or denomination that they 
adhere to. So as a result, right, you have these kind of articles coming out. This was in 2009, right? I mean, in 2019, sorry. Millennials aren't coming back to religion. They're leaving it entirely. Uh, but that, those kind of, again, those kind of online articles don't necessarily tell us the whole picture of, of what kind of spirituality millennials are embodying, right? So rather so, I want us to focus on this little quote here. And this quote, and I'll explain more, this quote kind of gets at the heart of really of spirituality amongst millennials today, and in particular, millennials who are, are religious knowns. They don't have any affiliation. They either left the church or they were never grown, they were never within a religious context. So this particular quote here highlights that. You go into our house? Yeah. Oh, that's a stalker. He's not, he's not a good guy. All right, if possible, whoever that is, could you please mute? My suggestion. I'm sorry. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I can. I can. I think I've got it muted. All right. No, you don't. Sorry, I'm just coming in. Oh, it's fine. All right. So, just a heads up. Let's all try to mute for right now, and then when we'll open, when I open the door up for discussion, then please unmute. I think that would be the best way of, of heading, continuing on with this further. Uh, but anyway, so here's the quote I want us to really focus on a little bit today. This is from the LA Times uh, by Jessica Roy. She, she wrote this article called How Millennials Replaced Religion with Astrology and Christmas. And it goes like this. Today, Leah Garzas is the co-host of a podcast called We Are Power Crystals. She does readings and workshops and sells jewelry and products through her business, Crystals of Altamira, and at Mostly Angels LA, a metaphysical shop in Beverly Wood that leans into its younger audience, selling crystal enhanced beauty products, candles with RuPaul on them, which were hit at DragCon, and pendants where the packaging reads, my intuition dismantles the patriarchy. Whew. There's a lot there. So let me briefly open the, this us for discussion. So what are you all hearing or what, can, what are you all reading in this particular uh, passage? So anyone? Well, I mean, who doesn't want a RuPaul candle? I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, that's a valuable product, I would say. I've read other stuff that that's like, you know, why millennials are seeking answers in astrology and all that sort of thing. It's and then just some com casual conversations with some mostly women. I think it's mostly women driving that in that demographic that they definitely talk about it a lot more casually. It's almost like the 70s. Like, what's your sign? Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Well, and I'm always frustrated because I half the time I don't know what they're talking about. Like, I don't know what RuPaul is. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just you're not in that mix of things, and I don't follow those. Trends. It's very. It's got roots in the '60s. Let the sunshine. Yeah. But they're not yeah. unique in the that. Uh, Crystals, uh, I'm Jim Baker, he used to say the streets of heaven are lined with crystal streets and lamp, sh and lamp lights. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be fun. That sounds like Disneyland. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but it's also very, almost exactly the same kind of thing that I worked a lot with back in the early 80s in Marin County when the New Age movement was at its peak. There are people, uh, people that have, uh, researchers that have developed uh, stages of development of humans. Uh, Ken Wilbur had a lot to say about this. And the different stages, I can't remember them all, but there's magic, then mythic, and then a few others to higher realms of consciousness. 
and the magic societies uh, believe that things would just happen, like uh, you could make rocks move, or you could, you know, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of religious practices even today are more in the magic realm. And this sounds like, the reading here, it sounds like there's a lot of magic thinking going on here. Some people, when they run away from religion, they end up almost creating a their sex version of it. Mm -hmm. Others? Well, I was thinking, this is Federico, I was thinking um, that it shows a little bit where you're putting uh, your faith. Uh, there is still an expression of faith there, but it's a faith on things that are not what we would consider faith. Um, it looks to me like <clears throat> they're still wanting to believe in something, whether it's crystals or essential oils, but there is some expression of belief there. So yeah, I mean, so I let's, Let's try to tie this all together. I think we've had a lot of really good points that are brought up. And I want to start with Federico's point here. Um, so sometimes the difficulty about reading these particular passages, right, is the question is, is where is the element of faith and spirituality in all this? Because, yeah, to some degree, there is, there is magical thinking in this. But on the other hand, right, what's not being said is important. So what's not being said is not that there isn't a there isn't a belief in a higher power or that, that there that there is no kind of deeper abiding kind of spiritual like spiritual presence in the world, but rather it's the element of faith here is a lot more what I would call a cosmic understanding. And when I mean cosmic, I mean there's there's a sense in which Faith isn't just something that we intellectually exercise, but it's one in which the whole senses and the world around are like kind of, are embodied within a particular kind of integration, right? An integration that not only just makes sense of things, but does it in a particular way to help people, right? You see at the end, my intuition dismantles the patriarchy. So it's not something that can be always can be rationally expressed, but it's something where it's the spirituality goes deeper than what they've kind of been embodied. They've kind of been taught, right? So a lot of what we can see here is a, really it's a reaction against a kind of faith that's been dogmatic, that's been a pure intellectual exercise that has no kind of bearing on one's day-to-day -day life. Right, and that, in a sense, manipulates and distorts creation and humanity in a way that actually doesn't bring life. Yeah. So a lot of what, of what this particular kind of, and I've, I've dealt with this before. I have friends who who are in this kind of a business. A lot of what these folks are attempting to do is to have the younger audience find ways in which they themselves are participating right, in a spiritual life with God that isn't, a, that isn't associated with a particular religious tradition. And so what's the easy way to do it is to go through these kind of new agey movements, right? Because in, in this new age, there's kind of uh, an egalitarianism. Um, there's kind of freedom and, and liberty to be able to pick and choose what you want to do, right? But still has a veneer of of like religion. So for example, the candles with RuPaul on them, right? That's like a votive candle. Who's like, you know, you go to the HEB or the Walmart, or you go to a Catholic church, you see these wonderful votive candles. They have the picture of the Virgen de Guadalupe. Well, for here, you have a picture of RuPaul, right? Or if you go to San Antonio, you have a pic the picture of Tim Duncan, or you have your Spurs candle, and you're, you're going to light it just in, just in case you want the Spurs to win, or you want your drag queen to win um, and RuPaul's Drag Race. So you, you see how there's kind of, there's this kind of a hodgepodge 
selection of of uh, spiritual practices that help just augment your own like connectedness to the world. Like that's why it's the focus is on crystals, on beauty projects, products, on pendants, right? Because there's a physicality to this whole millennial faith. It has to be something that's just not simply ingested in the mind, but you can, you can physically and tangibly touch it. So that's what, that's kind of the, 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 the thing that I want us to start to focus on because as we'll discuss this week and later on next week, a lot of the spiritual practices of millennials tend to focus on more superficial things. Like for example, like prayer beads, right? Or lighting of candles or kind of like contemplative labyrinth walks, right? There's a lot of these kind of things that please the eye and the senses are, are what we're focused on. But actually it goes beyond that. It goes into this kind of cosmic sense. All right, so. Sergio? Yes. Do you also think it's perhaps people wanting a spiritual discipline without being so caught up on the moralistic, um, I don't know, bumping of opinions that tends to go on in religious circles? Yeah, I think so. I think that's, I mean, if we go back, for example, to Leia Garza's like kind of quote there, my intuition dismantles the patriarchy. So there's a way in which she, she wants these kind of like, she sells these kind of disciplines for people to, to embody that doesn't get caught up with this kind of patriarchy that's always kind of ever present in like established religious organizations. So yeah, I mean, I see that, that's another way. I mean, we want, as a millennial, I want order without all the baggage, all this patriarchal baggage that sometimes comes with, uh, religion as a whole. Does that answer your question a bit? Or at least your conjecture? Yes, good. All right. With, the, um, with Ash Wednesday and the Ashes to Go, I'm curious, did you, I know we get a lot of just people off the street. Would you say a lot of those people were likely millennials because that's a physical thing to do? And you know, it's, it's interesting you say that and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that by saying this. Um, in, I'm a part of Proclaim, which is an LGBTQIA kind of networking group in the LCA, and the use is the use of ashes outside of the Ash Wednesday service is very very prevalent in our in our own like communal liturgies that we have. So ashes for us it's well on the one hand yes it's Ash Wednesday is a very important thing and I mean I go to it. and I think I would argue yes a lot of millennials that went there would probably because this is tangibleness they need. But on the other hand, in our own communities, right, we use ashes outside of the whole Lenten season as a way of, again, marking a repent, a renewal and a return to God. And so there's some, there's some communities like the Proclaim group, they use glitter ashes. I don't like glitter ashes, but some people use glitter ashes to emphasize this kind of connection between identity and, and aesthetics. Others? All right. So in addition to that, let's switch, switch slightly to what's known as political engagement, right? For all intents and purpose, millennials as a whole um, would see themselves as politically engaged, or at least attempting to be politically engaged. And so, and, and I'll, I'll mention this now, but then we'll discuss it later. One of the apprehensions that millennials have about organized religion is its disengagement with the political realm, right? But disengagement in a way that hinders people's self-expression, uh, racial identities, and, 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 and gendered realities, right? So these are millennials as a whole would like to think, right? The problem with the church today is that it's always aligning itself with socially conservative movements uh, that hinders our development. So as a whole, uh, millennials would quote unquote say, we would like the church to be a lot more politically engaged, that's engaged with 
the right women's rights, abortion rights, LGBTQIA issues. Um, and I find it interesting. I found this one from uh, the PRRI. Um, millennials as a whole, as you can tell, right from here, right, there's, there's not a lot of engagement, actual engagement. So the self-reporting that millennials do and the actual kind of action that is taken, two different things. Uh, I think the PRI called it slacktivism. It's a type of activism that is kind of born from this like social media world that we're in. Like a lot of things, political things that millennials tend to do, right? And the PRI has a little research on it, is to do what's called an online petition. So you just sign an online petition and that's it. I've done my political activism for the day. So actual like going out into the streets or going and calling a congressman, that just doesn't jive or line up. But for, for millennials as a whole, there's a deep kind of rooted connection to the, the political world. They want things to go in ways that help the marginalized, that help people who are on disability, that, that, help, that help the people on social security, and most importantly, that, that help students, right, like weighed down by student debt have some form of like relief. So they try to find, right, political candidates that to some degree reflect these ideals. And so I say that because millennials as a whole, there isn't this kind of easy division between church and state, right? Spirituality and, and political action. Sometimes, right, they meld in very nicely. Um, and so I bring up as a perfect example, Mayor Buttigieg, he's technically a millennial. He's the really old millennial. Uh, he was born in 82. Um, and as you remember, the cutoff starts in 81. So he's technically a millennial. And his husband's a millennial. And so we have like, if you think of it, two queer religious millennials running for the, that ran for the presidency, right? This is typically, this is actually atypical of millennials. As, as much as I would like to say, yes, we're, we're, we're making a change. Actually, this is very atypical for a general millennial. Millennials kind of don't do that. But when they do, right, they make big splashes, right? You have like Pete, Mayor Pete Buttigieg or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? Just another millennial uh, leader, right, that tries to engage questions of spirituality and questions of, of political engagement for her and Alina. for her. Lina Hidalgo también. Lina Hidalgo, exactly. Thoughts, questions? Um, is it okay if we move to the next slide? Yep. All right. I need to stop recording here as need to go ring bells, but carry on. This is excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. 